Major funding for American Masters is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support of viewers like you. Additional funding was provided by Rosalind P. Walter, Jack Rudin, and the Andre and Elizabeth Cortez Foundation. From the 1880s to the 1930s, American popular entertainment had many names. Variety, the two-a-day, vaudeville, vaudeville, vaudeville. For 25,000 performers, presenting their act up to a dozen times a day, it was always the business. Oh my, he's making a the He's a The business was conducted in lavish theaters in the heart of great cities and converted storefronts in towns so small there was only one road going in and out. Each performance had five acts or 10 or 20. You could get a seat in the second balcony for a nickel and stay all day. There was nothing separating that performer on stage from me. It was to me. He was singing to me. He was making cracks to me. He was jumping and tap dancing to me at that moment, and so it was highly personal. Yes, her, her poor father, uh, he died of throat trouble. They hung him. And her brother, lovely chap, but he's gone, poor fella. With good behavior, he ought to be out in uh, 1927 or 8. Vaudeville appealed primarily to the working class, but among its biggest fans were Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Woodrow Wilson. Its biggest stars were the highest paid, best known people in America. Vaudevillians danced, sang, juggled, and joked better than anybody, anywhere, ever. But they were still doomed. They were doomed because vaudeville was just a diversion until new technologies were ready to steal the audience away forever. I think the big majority of them just faded away. And I think that was an awful loss to this country and to this world. They were equipped for better things than what happened to them. But before radio, movies, and television, vaudevillians were the entertainers our ancestors chose first and most. At a time of revolutionary change in America, they showed us who we were and who we were becoming. This is their story. The story of the stars and the thousands of others who never escaped the small towns and small pay, who lost everything but their memories and their dreams.
There was a lot of us that could, couldn't make a dime, but we wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. In 1903, the Wright brothers made their first flight. Baseball had its first World Series. Henry Ford started his motor company. And in 2,000 theaters across North America, audiences watched performers like Weber and Fields as confused German immigrants. Back, 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 back. You, you've got to keep away three feet from the table. Three feet? Yes, sir. Well, when I'm close up, I'm three feet away. They saw the great volcano moving people and motor vehicles around with his teeth. And three young women throwing a handkerchief in the air. Who the young women were and why they chose to do a pajama handkerchief statue act has been lost to time. But they did it, and audiences wanted to see it. Audiences that had never existed before. In 1840, nine out of 10 Americans lived in the country. A few decades later, when vaudeville began, nearly half lived in the city, with millions more coming every year. They didn't all come from Michigan, the Carolinas, and Ohio. Some came from Kiev, Kalamara, and Bologna. Five and a half million immigrants in the 1880s alone, yearning to breathe free, even before the Statue of Liberty was there to point the way. They expected prosperity and happiness. They found cramped tenements, dull or deadly jobs, and a huge gap between the rich and the poor. Survival, not prosperity, was the daily challenge in the burgeoning urban ghettos. But in the nearby vaudeville theaters, the newly arrived Irish, Jews, Germans, and Slavs could see their countrymen making it. At the same time, many working people finally had spare time and spare change. They were typists, telephone operators, bookkeepers, no longer down in the mine or standing at the blast furnace at dawn, no longer exhausted by their work. Now they were just bored by it. They demanded entertainment, and vaudeville had it. Sweet, sweet for me, he's white sweet for me. My baby, he's got red hair and fresh. I must have been 13, 14 years old, and for the next 10 years, the Palace Theater was my uh, heavenly sanctuary. It was every Friday night. My brother, five years old, and I would take me to the Palace Theater in Chicago. It was the two-a-day vaudeville house, nine acts. Friday nights, second balcony, two bits, as close to heaven as I'll ever get. Very often people will say, well, it was sensational, you know, as a negative. Like, what could be more important than, than giving people sensations? Taking ideas and making them felt sensational. <laughs> Vaudeville was the right sensation at the right time, but it didn't spring up overnight. Its origins were ancient and everywhere. Street performers, jesters, clowns, Yiddish Broder singers, and Commedia dell'arte players, they were the first vaudevillians. The word Commedia comes up a lot, the sort of the predecessor to vaudeville by a few centuries. I mean, you often see people See, I have done a lot of comedia. I've done a great deal of comedia work. And, and not to badmouth anybody, but what, what you sometimes see is somebody doing something that sort of in effect says, if you'd read as much as I've read, you'd find this very funny. And uh, that's what I hope in one's admiration and fascination with vaudeville one could stay away from. What would become vaudeville began in what would become English Music Hall, the lavish stage productions called pantos that British audiences have enjoyed for three centuries. Pantos have variety acts, slapstick, people in animal costumes, and the most famous panto feature, comic cross-dressing, like the pantomime dame, a male comedian dressed as a woman. Famous dames like George Roby became stars of the Music Hall. 
where the usual acts were either comic songs and when I found it left me in the lurch oh lord how it did to me or the eccentric like little Titch a very short man with very long boots Vaudeville's acceptance of slapstick female and serious male impersonators is a direct result of its English origins. English audiences gave their American cousins a love for the eccentric too, like Wilson, Kevill, and Betty. Their act, called Cleopatra's Nightmare, won international praise for 60 years, except in Germany, where the Nazis condemned their bare legs as immoral. P.T. Barnum contributed to vaudeville by establishing a crude variety theater in his Bowery Dime Museum and presenting the circus-inspired freak acts that would also appeal to vaudeville audiences, like Chaz Chase, the eater of strange things. In Barnum's, Immigrants and their children, like Joe Weber and Lou Fields, saw an escape from the ghettos and sweatshops that otherwise loomed in their future. Two other popular theatrical forms also contributed to vaudeville. The million European Jews who came west brought the Yiddish theater with them. Like vaudeville, it showed a robust passion for material and performance. Yiddish theater developed talent that would intrigue vaudeville audiences too. None better or better loved than Molly Pecan. Burlesque had the same British roots and some of the same attractions as vaudeville, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. The male burlesque audience came to see naked women, and the family vaudeville audience didn't. And though many vaudevillians also worked in burlesque, it's impossible to say how many because they hid their involvement afterwards. If you were in a, in a town where a burlesque company was or something, and the burlesque people were in town, one never stayed at the same hotel or ate in the same restaurants with them because they were de class A. Burlesque and vaudeville are two different phases of show business. Burlesque is a series of sketches. Sketches broken up with in between chorus girls and strip women. Top banana Joey Fay created and performed hundreds of those sketches. <laughs> Besides Joey Fay, two other vaudeville stars with burlesque beginnings were Fanny Bryce, billed as a demure soubrette, which means she kept her clothes on, and Bert Lahr, who did a burlesque-inspired cop act with his wife 20 years before he became a cowardly lion. She played a kind of hoochie-coochie dancer, and Dad, who played a kind of crazy cop, would uh, come out with his hat askew and his club and say, what's the idea, what's the idea, where'd you get that stuff? And she'd be sort of in a decollete, and he'd say, uh, what's your name? And she'd say, Molly Bean, and he'd say, your sister's name is String Bing? And she said, yeah, and your daughter's name is Lima Bean? And she said, yeah, and he'd say, well, don't you recognize me? I'm your uncle Succotash. He would do a sing and waddle around and 
throw throw his baton back and forth and then miss it. And he, they worked out this stuff. But even featuring an ogling cop and a beautiful girl, they worked it out clean. Vaudeville demanded it. There were signs backstage saying no hells, no dams, no deity of any sort to be mentioned at any time, and ladies must all wear silk tights. It was policed. Vaudeville was family entertainment. October 24th, 1881, will remain forever as one of the most memorable milestones in the annals of the entertainment world. For it was on this date in a little theater on 14th Street, just off Broadway, that the inimitable Tony Pastor startled the profession by presenting a straight variety show, or what was to become universally known as vaudeville. Tony Pastor insisted on propriety, because that's what the new audience wanted. A theater, as one vaudevillian said, where a child could bring his parents without fear of embarrassment, featuring sedate quartets. And bucolic comedians. And it worked immediately. Well, where is the girl's dance too? Even respectable women loved this new entertainment, especially a pastor innovation. The door prize. From silk dresses to sacks of potatoes. Vaudeville's success was due to a simple concept. If you don't like this, wait a few minutes. And you may like this. If you don't like primeval country music, you're sure to like a big star like Trixie Faganza. A little girl named Lulu went down to Honolulu to learn to do the hula, hula hoo. But one day little Lula broke her hula hula when she fell upon her wicky wacky woo. Now this little girl named Lulu who went to Honolulu to learn to do the hula hula hoo. No more to do the hula. I think seeing those acts, those artists on stage, those flesh and blood people, and you flesh and blood up in that second balcony, with all those other people in the audience, also afforded a sense of community. It was communal. The many enjoying the artiste, enjoying the gypsy entertainer, the gypsy. Pastor and his successors created the form. Changing times provided the audience. In the cities and eventually across the continent, all that was needed was people with talent. Many of them came from that audience, commercializing their existing skills, developing new ones, following their heroes into the light. My favorite guy, of course, was Jack Benny, who I loved. He was a great man and a very sweet guy. And I met him when I was 12 years old. And here the man walks in, takes off his hat in his top coat, fixes his hair and walks out on the stage, does a monologue and kills the people. And I said, that's, what, that's the kind of work I want to do. I loved what I was seeing on the stage at the uh, Standard Theater in Philadelphia. And that's where my mother and father played with the orchestra. And I liked what I saw up there. So I would go home and try to imitate what I saw. And I was doing it. Hey, this feels good. I like this. I like it so much. I had watched vaudeville from the 25 cent seats in the Palace Theater for years. And I watched, I watched all the acts. I watched the, so I was sort of a little sure of myself because I was stealing from the best 
and I was using the, the you know, I take the same jokes and I do them, and I was very good at. Six or seven years old, I went into the RKO Theater in Yonkers, and it was a Friday, and they had five acts of vaudeville, and I watched them, and I stayed and I watched them again, and I got home and I started dancing, out in the street, dancing. Actually, I was uh, two years and nine months, my mother says. But I say I was three, just to make it plausible. Uh, I, my mother used to take me to see all the shows, the vaudeville shows, and I would come home and I would imitate everybody. They imitated, they listened, they learned searching for the secrets to stardom. Composer Gerald Marx spent a week in the wings studying Houdini. The last uh, thing in his act was his being lowered into the tank. And he would say, this is a very, very dangerous thing that I'm going to do, and I never know whether I'm going to come out alive or not. So I always kiss my wife goodbye and she always sat in the front row and she came up the stairs and he kissed her and then they lowered him into the tank and I watched this and watched it and watched it where did he get the key to open up the lock so he could get out of the tank and I finally saw it. When she kissed him, she gave him the key. You took my kisses, and you took my love. You taught me how to care. Am I to be just the remnant of? Gerald Marx sold his first vaudeville song when he was only 10 years old to the pit conductor of his neighborhood theater. The next weekend, he snuck into the premiere performance. Nothing left for me to say. And when I heard them go into it, I did an awful thing in my pants. I was so excited. First of all, at 18 months, I got up on my toes and danced around. And mother and the family saw that and said, wowie, <laughs> that's a marketable thing. June Havoc and her sister, who became Gypsy Rose Lee, were in vaudeville because their mother was in it. And she was in it, so she said, for the money. And that was true of everybody. They were businessmen. They were incidentally artists. You know, they weren't going for art, they were going for survival. It was all about money. I mean, Groucho and my father never got past the sort of fifth or sixth grade. Buster Keaton had exactly one day of formal education. So they had no possibilities in American life, although they became the metaphors of uh, American abundance. When the average American was making $25 a week. The average salary of a dance act like ours was three fifty dollars a week. After we played the palace and we became a, well, so-called success, we did a good show. Then we were booked on the Orpheum circuit, the interstate circuit, for $450. Making a living as a variety performer was easy in only one way. Vaudeville was a most democratic entertainment. Gender, race, national origin, even appearance didn't matter. The Goldinis were hardly glamorous, but they were incredible spinners, and vaudeville audiences loved watching things spin. Julian Elting was Vaudeville's most famous female impersonator. 
called Mr. Lillian Russell long after he lost his youthful charm, but audiences still wanted to watch him. I used to like to go down to the uh, corner drugstore and buy candy, but my arms were so short I couldn't reach into my pants pocket to get out the change. So my dad taught me how to stand on my head, and that's what got me into show business. You know, I'm a cello player, so I played the cello, and my brother played the piano, and we sang a couple of songs. After the, the show, when we got off the stage, my brother said, where'd you get those lines? I said, I don't know, I guess I made them up. He said, well, make up some more. I didn't know I was going to be a good comedian until I went into a show. And whenever I would walk on the stage, the audience would laugh. In vaudeville, if people wanted to watch it, you could make a living doing it. Hundreds of possible acts are described in this 1914 handbook, from playing the piano to eating the piano. I have people like the man who swallows hot molten lead and spits up coins. He also swallows a live goldfish and a live shark, baby shark. He will swallow both and he asks the audience, now which do you want to come up first? And they will say the shark or the goldfish, he'll throw that one up first and you'll hear it swimming around in the stomach. And then you'll throw up the shark, and you'll have them in two little jars, and you'll see them still swimming. They're still alive. He's a geek act. No, he's not. He's not a geek. No, he's not a geek. He is a regurgitator. <laughs> ah. There's a difference. Vaudeville's most famous regurgitator was the legendary Haji Ali. As mysterious as Haji Ali, but a lot less graphic was A. Robbins, the Banana Man. He was a strange figure with a, in a capacious black cloak, huge, and he would say nothing but take out objects and he'd unfold them. One would become an easy chair, another would become a sofa, another finally became a grand piano time he finished after six, seven, eight minutes, the whole stage was full of furniture, huge, tremendous, and he'd simply walk off. A. Robbins. Magic. There is nothing more important, although we've lost it in our moment, than frivolity. Frivolity is the, the, the species' refusal to suffer. Vaudeville's attractions weren't always variety performers. If people were famous for any reason, audiences wanted to gawk at them. We were on the bill with Jane Harlow. That was a vaudeville date that we did at the Oriental. And she had uh, a maid with her, and she did a scene with some guy, and they did a scene from one of the movies. That was vaudeville, too. Charles Lindbergh declined $100,000 a week to appear in vaudeville. Evangelist Amy Simple McPherson accepted $5,000 and bombed. One reviewer said she wears a white satin creation, sexy, but Episcopalian. Temperance crusader Carrie Nation enhanced her vaudeville act by handing out souvenir axes to remind audiences of her saloon-smashing fame. Other famous folks actually tried to perform with mixed results.
From Babe Ruth to Helen Keller, from Robert Benchley to Jack Johnson, if you wanted to make direct contact with America, show your stuff, and make good money besides, you went on the vaudeville stage. As George E. Jessup said to me, when you're a star, when they love you, they'll take anything you give them. I said, that's all well and good, but how do you get there? You've got to get there first. You got help getting there, wherever you could buy, borrow, or steal it. Acting and dancing schools flourished, including a Pittsburgh academy where young Gene Kelly helped touring vaudevillians polish their soft shoe. And B&B's College of Dance in New York, where George Burns taught tap. So I would go to the Palace Theater, which was the, the aim of every, every performer in show business, and I would try every door till I found an open one and go in, the theater's dark, and I knew the layout, went down to the men's room and stayed there in the dark until the lights came on. And then I'd come up and work my way along the wall, way down, so that I could be close to the stage and see exactly what the star of the evening does, his behavior, so that I could learn and when the girl came and asked for my stub, which I didn't have, I ran right back and got lost among the standees. Those were the days that all the vaudeville houses in Chicago, that's where I was born and raised, had vaudeville, and after the vaudeville acts, they had amateur shows. And I went down and I used to do my solo, Stars and Stripes Forever. So I did about five weeks of, of uh, amateurs, and during those five weeks, five nights a week in five different theaters, I won the prize every night, which, of course, was proof of something. For Arthur Tracy, winning amateur nights led to stardom in England and America. Martha, when I look for your love, and I find you are He didn't just have good pipes. He created a personality, the street singer. A mysterious, romantic wanderer, wavering away under boudoir windows. Personality. Whether created, like Arthur Tracy's, or natural, like Joe Frisco's, was one of the vital ingredients of vaudeville's success. We heard him, we heard her, we saw him, we saw a flesh and blood figure, and we applauded. You saw them do it, they did it, boner or not, mistakes or not, ecce homo. Behold the man, behold the woman. Every night I bring her frankfurter sandwiches, frankfurter sandwiches. How my baby loves those frankfurter sandwiches, frankfurter sandwiches. I tried to win her with flowers, flowers. All kinds of sweetness Till I found out my baby's weakness Every night she whispers Thank for sandwiches, thank for sandwiches But I fear there's something wrong Instead of her billing and cooing All she starts doing is chewing Right for sandwiches, right for sandwiches All night long W.C. Fields became a juggler partly Because the props were handy on his father's food cart but vaudeville was full of great jugglers. Fields once followed a dwarf who juggled 14 balls while riding a horse. Nine balls and one horse, more than Fields could do. So he developed an intriguing personality who was harassed by everything, children, policemen, billiard balls. That character took Fields to the top in vaudeville, radio, and film. 
Like personality, enthusiasm was another quality every successful vaudevillian had. Al Jolson screamed, you ain't heard nothing yet, and meant it. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. Eva Tangway, one of vaudeville's first great stars, ran more than three miles on stage during her act. And Eddie Peabody played his banjo like it was on fire. more payments in your mind, honey. I love this thing. Because audiences loved enthusiasm, one musical instrument reached its artistic apotheosis in vaudeville, the ukulele. Like the bongos, an instrument where energetic playing is synonymous with good playing. Vaudeville had a lot of ukulele players. The secret is whole game in vaudeville is speed. Every act I ever saw was quick. Uh, Lenny, oh, Lenny Reed. Calling me? Yeah, this is my boy, Lenny. How are you? All right, William. Oh, Lenny, I was just standing here telling the folks how great you are. Really? You're wonderful, lad. Good. Lenny Reed and Willie Bryant started as a team in 1930, singing, dancing, doing it quick. The first number alone was only a minute and 10 seconds. That was a soft shoe. Then Willie danced for two minutes, and I danced for two minutes, and then we finished with the stairs, which was about three minutes. And the talk was another two or three minutes. Nine, 10 minutes, we never went over 10 minutes or we'd been fired. I think we did 11 minutes in the Oriental, and the, and the uh, stage manager called us in and said, you know, you did 11 minutes. Can you cut it? Personality, enthusiasm, and speed were vaudeville requirements. But it is typical of the medium's perversity that an intentional lack of all three could still succeed. Well, Benny Ross and the here. gorgeously Let's dull, unenthusiastic, life, practically comatose Maxine Stone. Well, there's life there anyway. Look, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll play the piano, you do that dance of yours. Let's get it over with. Ladies and gentlemen, right at this part of my dance, I do a trick. I know you've all seen it before, so I won't bother. Forget about it. Who wants to do it? But... Everybody needed time. Dancers needed space. Given the variety of stages they worked, they learned to minimize the space they needed, like the Mayo Brothers, who performed real table dancing. Push that table out there, and we dance on that table. So we didn't have to worry about the rest of the stage, no matter what it was or where it was. We could work anywhere, out in, out in the sand, if we had to. A strong 10 minutes could still fail if there was nothing to set your act apart from hundreds of others. So performers developed gimmicks, unique signature pieces they called insurance. Xylophonist Teddy Brown's gimmick was his size. 
the incongruity of a very large man daintily plinking away. Joey Fay's gimmick was nasal. Sneeze. We worked on the sneeze for a month, for a year. We worked on it, and I tried all different types of sneeze. I tried all the every. I couldn't. I couldn't get it. Finally, finally one day, I, it's a noise in my throat, and it's a. And it, it got a laugh, and I said, "That's it." You make the sneeze as loud as a, or as short as a. M I S S I S F I V V I. Insurance was the material that always went over. Josephson singing Mammy, Francis White singing Mississippi. But this I study. Use and reuse and constant um, re reuse of signature bits is, I think, uh, a vaudevillian, comes out of the vaudevillian tradition. I myself would never have been able to do uh, uh, week after week exactly the same uh, routine. And that's why I don't think I would have done well in vaudeville at all as, as a person. <laughs> If even your insurance didn't work, a successful vaudevillian had other talents to draw on. Iron Eyes Cody sang, danced, healed the sick, and then shot at them. I had a bow and arrow act. I'm an expert with a bow and arrow. And I have people who stand there and I shoot arrows all around them and everything like that. How tall was I then? Let's say three foot package. You know, singing, dancing, doing impersonations. I did Al Jolson then and Eddie Cantor then. Will Rogers started as a Wild West show cowboy, then did rope tricks without talking, then did rope tricks while talking, then talked without doing many rope tricks. And by then, he was a star. I was always a featured act because I did a novelty act like a one-man band. I played on spoons, washboard, bicycle pumps, lift chairs with my teeth. Singer, dancer, musician, comedian, impressionist Max Nesbitt and his brother Harry did a whole vaudeville show in 10 minutes. Folks, you ought to see my baby, the sweetest little baby in all the world. Oh, you ain't seen any baby yet. You ought to see my baby. You know, my baby keeps me up all night. But what do you mean? Listen. There were nine numbers in the act, and I was in seven of them. It was a wonderful act. I tap danced, I sang, I did an adagio dance, I toe danced, I wept in a dramatic song about my dog. When they started their careers, June Havoc, Bobby Short, Billy Barty, Bert Lahr, and a horde of others had an automatic gimmick. They were kids some of the thousands of tots who invaded vaudeville from the very beginning. Producers like Gus Edwards specialized in turning children into marketable commodities. I sure do remember the first time I walked on a vaudeville stage. I was with Gus Edwards at the time, and I was wearing velour pants with a, a safety pin. And I looked down, and the pants were open, and I had no way of closing them. I entered uh, vaudeville when I was a baby. I was a little 12-year-old boy. I played the piano and sang. And in those days, we dressed up quite a lot. In the, and I wore white tails. And I was called the miniature king of swing, and sometimes the boy wonder, and sometimes the schwarze wunderkind. I was billed being younger than I really was. You know, they said, Jamie, to Christmas, here's a three-year-old. He's acting like an eight-year-old. And I was eight years old. <laughs> Among the greatest of all kid acts was the Nicholas Brothers. Uh, 
Now they weren't called the Nicholas brothers then, they were called the Nicholas kids. And these kids were big. When Harold came out to do the encore, you couldn't hear, you couldn't hear your ears. People were screaming and hollering. And when they said, Reed and Bryant put up the sign, didn't mean hell. We were out there, I'm not kidding you, we were dancing halfway through our routine and they were applauding. Willie said, we got them. I said, you got hell. They're applauding for them, they're not applauding for them, but we kept dancing. We didn't get on, as they say in show business. So I said, move over, let's get off. And they came back and bowed again. We had to start our routine again. And I'm not kidding, they were still applauding. When I was on my radio show, people wrote in letters saying that's not a child, that's a 45-year-old midget. No child sings like that. Had a very strong, deep voice like uh, I do now. And it, was, it wasn't a Shirley Temple kind of voice. It was like a Sophie Tucker kind of voice. And to see this little thing belting out these songs, you know. Ah, you Because of radio, Rose Marie was already a star when she entered vaudeville. An old pro at age six. A lot of other kid act performers had to grow up fast. I got hurt a lot, but uh, everybody got hurt a lot. Being hurt wasn't any wasn't important. The important thing was to cover that bruise and get out there. <laughs> what made it worth it? I would say when my dad was very proud of me, he stopped hollering at me, because when I was a child, he would say to me, you can dance a little more. When I was three, he'd say, your toes aren't bleeding enough. I remember dancing with blood in my toe shoes, squishing, squish, squish, squish. My father used to have a thing like, what do you think you do? You sing just because you sing or something? I don't look at it as a negative thing that my mother and dad took me out of school and made me go out on the road. And no, I think it was a positive, positive part of my life. I didn't get a lot of love from my family. I was a workhorse and I was taking care of a lot of people and I went through a lot. I looked to pets, I looked to other people, particularly the audience. Like I had a pet mouse for a long time, until my father sat on it and broke my heart. Thelma White started in a kid sister act, with a kid who was not her sister. Like most juvenile performers, she had a problem that adults did not, the Gary Society, upholders of the child labor laws. They made arrangements with this society there that um, my father would get arrested after each show, and they would bail him out and, I'd, and go back to the theater. He, I would do the second show. They'd arrest him. He'd go down. And I played the week like that. My father was arrested 182 times. Two officers came down, stopped my act, put a coat around me, and took me off to the shelter where they asked me how old I was. And I said I was 16. I'd been rehearsed. I was about nine. And they then they did a little physical on me and found out I didn't even have any molars yet. You know, <laughs> when you're 16, you've got molars, so. I suppose that a 12-year-old colored lad playing the piano and singing might have posed a threat to some old vaudevillians, you know, and it was their bread and butter, their life's blood, their life's work. And uh, they were not pleased to see me on the stage. I don't think the color of my skin had much to do with it. I was a kid. And a kid performer, like an animal act, uh, is always a threat to other performers. Competition of all ages was a threat to performers, but these men were a bigger threat. They controlled the nation's theaters, the big time, middle time, and small time circuits. If they didn't like you, you could have the best act on earth, but there was nowhere on earth you could do it. Benjamin Franklin Keith, who first used the French term vaudeville for variety entertainment, and his manager, Edward F. Albee, were the most powerful men in the business, establishing a nationwide circuit and running it like a dictatorship. Western circuit owner Alexander Plantagius was a failed Klondike gold miner, while impresario Sylvester Poli got his showbiz start melting the discarded heads in a wax museum. 
Vaudevillians knew these men and their empires as well as they knew their own acts. There was the Pantage circuit had 20 weeks of work. The Low circuit had about 25 weeks of work. The Orpheum circuit One was a had 10 weeks of circuit. work. The Interstate And then circuit. Oakland was a California theater and an Orpheum theater. And then we played other little towns all over California, too. And then down south was a Kemp time. To Tulsa, to, to Oklahoma Kemp. City, to Muskogee, to Dallas, to Houston, to Galveston, to Sweetport, to New Orleans, we uh, Dal uh, New Orleans, Orleans Mobile, Alabama, a big act. Uh, Gas and in Alabama. Then uh, I was Dainty June, the darling of Vaudeville, registered you as Pat Off, because we hit the big time by the time I was about six. Circuit owners controlled where an act played. Their theater managers controlled when it played. Placement on the program was crucial to an act's success because it indicated how good you were. If an act moved up, down, or off the bill, everybody in the business knew it. Fred Astaire once was replaced by a dog act and never forgot it. We're the Reese brothers. Yeah, we're headlining here this week. Oh, yeah? Where's the dressing room? You dress upstairs in the deluxe suite. Is that the star's dressing room? Oh, by all means. In fact, it's the only dressing room we got. What? That is the only dressing room we got for stars. Oh. What time do we go on? You open the show. We don't open no shows. The all opening right? act of a vaudeville show was usually silent and easily ignored, which is why vaudevillians hated opening. Often a family, say a Lebanese family, there was the older brother, the strong brother, the strong man, and on his shoulders, arms, are two brothers hanging, two brothers from his hips, and on his, on the top is a little brother, and the little brother is hoisting a little sister on the top. It was a fantastic act. How long could he hold this? How long could they hold it? And then they would tumble down on their feet gracefully, and the hands would be like that. They'd make it. That was a great act. Animals open too, occasionally over the human performer's objections. Nobody liked the fall animal acts, you know. Oh, Lady Alice was a, she was a very elegant dowager type who wore a beaded gown. And then the highlight of the act was when she would, they'd bring on this big velvet box and she'd put one arm inside the box. The music would start up nice and loud, and the rats would come across and walk all across her shoulder to her other hand. And she'd wiggle them a little bit until they were all in the right position, and then, ta-da, the little rat would be up here. And then she'd hold this kazoo up to the rat's face, and the kazoo would go, poop, you know, naturally, but the rat was breathing into it because she was covered from here to here with cream of wheat. Being the second act on the bill wasn't much better than opening. The second act was always a couple of girls singing, a sister team usually, that type of thing. Happy in the car, mama loves you, happy we are. And you find him not very far, ten little miles from town. And you open your eyes, you're in the morning when the sun starts to rise. And drop that blue in the sky, ten little miles from town. In the third spot on the bill were short plays performed by legitimate theater actors like Ethel Barrymore. For decades, she trotted out a one act for vaudeville called The Twelve Pound Look. As I remember it, it was a typewriter, and that typewriter that she learned gave her the job outside the kitchen. And somehow, I, as I remember it, that's what it was about. But it was something seeing her. I'd never seen her in a play. Helen Hayes, Alfred Lunt, Sarah Bernhardt and many other theater actors found occasional work in vaudeville. In playlets written by everyone from Eugene O'Neill to the drummer in the house band. Were the plays that were done in vaudeville, were they very good plays? No. Following the dramatic interlude were acts that woke up the audience, like Brown, Rich, and Ball. Hey, wait a minute, the music stopped. I didn't hear it. Oh, she didn't hear it. Let's try it again. I did an Apache number. If you read about the review, you wouldn't believe it. Little girl goes through mayhem, they would say. And how she comes up with no bones broken is a miracle and things like that. 
right before intermission were near headliners like rising stars or falling stars. Fuzzy Knight became a famous sidekick in cowboy movies. In vaudeville, he achieved near stardom by making a sidekick out of his piano. No, no drinks today. Big acts played right after intermission. Big production numbers. Big bands. Big nut acts like Jimmy Durant. I took a walk down Broadway with my ten children. Yeah? And a policeman came up to me and said, under arrest. For what? I said, for what? I didn't do nothing. Nah. He said, you must have done something with that crowd following you. What? I, I did pretty good all by myself, but they gave me a terrific write-up, and they said she would make a good second act any place. I didn't like that. I thought I'm going to be next to closing or else. But anyway, I worked, and, and a couple times I was next to closing. <laughs> the most coveted spot of the show, where every act wanted to play, was next to last. Oh, oh, You're so smart. Name three different kinds of nuts. Walnuts. Chestnuts? That's two. And forget me nuts. Lovely. If you were there, you were a star, or at least the best act on the bill. What did you take up at school? Anything that wasn't nailed down. You're too smart for one girl. I'm more than one. You're more than one? Yeah, my mother has a picture of me when I was two. In 1922, when a lackluster dancer and SEAL trainer named Burns teamed up with half of just another sister act named Alan, they moved from everywhere else on the bill to next to closing and stayed there. We don't open no shows. All right. You can close the show. And we don't close any shows. Well, you'll either open or close the show here. We must be the only act on the bill. For performers, the closing spot on a vaudeville bill was called playing to the haircuts because that's what they saw going up the aisle. To drive audiences away, and make room for the new audience, managers would purposely book bad acts for closing. Acts like a one-man harp and ocarina combo. Remember, that audience was also an antagonist, as well as a friend the old-time uh, vaudevillians. I killed that audience. What, what happened? I slew them. I murdered them. The words they use are violent words. And so there was a hostility and love, hostility and a hunger, a need, a yearning for adulation. At the same time, there was both. It's very personal. A love-hate relationship was there. Sometimes we simply killed the audience. They loved it, and sometimes I couldn't get off fast enough. When I go out in front of an audience, I'm going to a lover. I said, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to lay them out in the eyes, because nobody, I said, is going to take it away from me. I worked through chicken pox, the mumps, the measles. I must have infected hundreds of people. <laughs> Suppose we meet her, Mr. Gallagher. 50-50, Mr. Sheen. No, I remember Gallagher and Sheehan. When they opened at the palace, they were a huge success. And they were booked after that in Philadelphia, where they flopped. <laughs> they didn't even run the week in Philly. For eight, it was 90 miles away. And I said, uh, I don't mind if you walk out on me. It's when you come towards me, I get nervous. The uh, white audiences are harder to please than the black audience. Black audience seemed to be starved for something to see or something to do because they were restricted to certain places. The, the black audiences up in Harlem, for example, were tougher on hoofers than any white audience you've ever seen. 
the white audience will give you a break. The colored audience, if you don't dance, forget it. There's some chicken wire in an oval shape up in, the, up in the ceiling. And I said to the boss, I said, what's that? He says, well, on Saturday night, they get kind of noisy here. And he says, to protect the band and the uh, orchestra, we lowered that. I once watched my father in a, in a show called The Beauty Part go out on stage and get a big laugh on a conjunction, like but or and. And I just could not understand it. And I said, Dad, how did you know that there was a laugh at that point? And he said, John, I listened to the audience, and they told me where the laugh was. Hollywood's vaudeville recreations, even those starring ex vaudevillians are really accurate. Old men dance ancient routines perfectly without any rehearsal. Reality was different. In vaudeville, you perfected an act. And I mean perfected it. We used to spend as much as an hour, everyone's, just on how far you down your bow. My father didn't mind. My father said, oh, she loves to dance. She, you know, I, to my father I was gorgeous and beautiful and terrific, but my mother didn't like the idea, no. She thought just bums are in show business. It was sort of, a, in, their, in, in their eyes, it was sort of like indecent exposure, you know? Well, I mean, I was making $40, $50 a week during, my God, during those days. It was a big money. I. And, uh, but I couldn't take any of it home or anything because my father didn't know I was in show business. In one season, Bert Law and his wife made these 48 stops across North America. Vaudevillians spent their lives on the road. And the Laws had it made. The smallest town they played was Davenport. Before the Marx Brothers hit the big time, they played theaters where the three-piece orchestra was a piano player, a piano, and a stool. When we traveled in Vaudeville, it was kind of rough. We had an old Chrysler that my brother bought, and uh, we, we just never got the money, never got paid to, to get on a train or get on a plane or anything like that. So we used to get in the car and go. No matter where we had to go, we went by car. The only way we could save money. My mother and my father, my two sisters, myself, and the school teacher would all travel in this car. And it was loaded. We had everything that we needed and the dinner was ready. Mom would cook, a great cook, on a little two-heater stove, you know. There were some hotels that were very homey, very welcoming. Other hotels didn't want show people at all. The early parts of Audible, you lived in some awfully crummy places. We had to. We didn't all become stars overnight. I never became a star, but I lived like one. But you worked, I mean, you, you, were, you were a slave. I was absolutely miserable. I remember being in Los Angeles downtown with my mother, and we had 25 cents, and that was all we had, and we had no job. I was about, I guess, three and a half. It was in that part. But my first paying job, I remember, my husband and I started form an act together. We got $7 a piece. $14 for the two of us, <laughs> that's the truth. I was shocked at being called a drag queen because I was an actor. And then afterwards I said, oh, what the hell, I'm making a living, and that's it, money is money. I remember going to the music director one day and um, asking him if I could have a vacation. He said, you can take all the vacation you want. He said, you don't have to come back. For one group of vaudevillians, the artist of color, you don't have to come back, wasn't just an idle management threat. It was life itself. 
Vaudeville began in the 1880s, just as the Chinese Exclusion Act took effect, prohibiting Chinese immigration to the United States far into the next century. Vaudeville thrived as the Supreme Court affirmed in Plessy v. Ferguson that separate but equal was constitutionally acceptable. The social and political opportunities for minorities that were established in antebellum America were rapidly disappearing. African Americans and other ethnic groups were being put back in their place. Ironically, one of those places was the stage. Yes, sir, does my baby no, sir. No, man, baby, yes, sir, does my baby now. The singer is Italian. His act is Asian. His musical instrument is Hawaiian and his song was written by a nice Jewish boy. Vaudeville reflected its time, a time when America was becoming a melting pot, whether some Americans liked it or not. I'm Italian. I'm of Italian ancestry. My, my real name, many, many years ago, before mom and dad changed it, was Bert Mazzetti. But it wouldn't fit on the marquee. Nobody wanted to be known, it really, as an Italian. You were really looked down on. Then that went to the Polish people. <laughs> and probably for the Polish people or the Jewish people. And then, you know, and the same joke. There were also Greek stereotypes. There was always the Greek who ran the fruit store down the street or had the, the, had the little, little shop, the delicatessen. God knows there were Jewish stereotypes. There were Italian stereotypes. There were popular songs written in the Greek idiom, in the Jewish idiom, in the Italian idiom. We grew up with those songs. That was, America was about all of those things. I did an Italian number in my act where I did very badly broken Italian and sang with a little boy about how we were going to go back to the old country and make spaghetti and have kids and live the proper life and we'll leave the monkey behind. All those things that were not valuable to the, to the official culture were very, very valuable to the pop culture. Their songs, their sounds, their linguistic mistakes, everything was usable. Reverend Fields made a career out of the assimilation mistakes of every ethnicity, but their own. They were born Orthodox Jews, but they never played Jews. They started in blackface, were Irishmen sometimes, and became America's best known Germans. No, no, you dance. Yeah. You, you dance and do this it. against the law. Huh? It's against the law. They'll sue me. Brooklyn-born Van and Skank were the musical Weber and Fields, building their act around other people's ethnicity. They became Italians, praising Pasta Vazula. Hungry women. There were Jews reciting hungry women. I feed them and weep. Oh, they make me dig deep. There were Chinese singing Chinese Firecracker. With a in voicing, goy hong, loy hong, a Chinese punk, which means who the hell he put the firecracker under my bunk. China boy, go sleep. Close your eyes, don't peep. Sand man soon will come. When most Americans only knew their immediate neighbors and worried that every new arriving ethnic group would take their jobs, marry their daughters, and overwhelm their communities, acts like Holy One and his orchestra showed people who didn't know any better that Asians could do something besides laundry and could play something besides the gong. Miss Toy now sing a famous Chinese song. Ming and Toy challenged their stereotype image by laughing at it. Just like Fanny Bryce. And the guy named Achman Hemel, they've knocked me off my camel. He's out there much and fun, my dear. He told me to the fountain, like a guy would tell a cow. The harem days, they called me a name. 
Cause I'm his favorite now. I'm touching him, touching him, touching him. Most of his time spent, he's hanging around my tent. The picture, him to lift him, touch him. The touching thing about vaudeville is it's like first generation America getting a foothold in the world of America, singing about it, celebrating it, suffering it, and giving all that longing and high times to the people, giving it back. As each new immigrant group got more of a foothold in America, they filled more theater seats, and what they saw of themselves on stage changed for the better. Vaudevillians knew you don't get nasty about the Irish in a theater full of Irish. But with African Americans segregated in the balcony, or excluded entirely from the audience, there was no such thing in mainstream vaudeville as a theater full of them. And it was that way for almost a century. Hey, Skinny! The minstrel show's coming to town! Beginning in the 1840s, the minstrel show was America's first entertainment craze. It started with northern white performers who observed blacks or Negroes or slaves at that point, um, really entertaining themselves. Say, I have an idea. Yes. You'll be around here about a half hour before the show. You mean you gonna let me watch up close? Jim Crow, you'll practically be right on the stage. Woo! Wheel about and turn about, JJ. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Give me back my clothes, please. What they did was to imitate some of the actions they saw, some of the songs that they saw these slaves singing, and to put on uh, grease paint or blackface. <laughs> Blacks had little power to protest their characterizations, although many tried. Whites could parody them, but they could parody no one but themselves. Eventually, African Americans formed their own minstrel companies, billing themselves as real Negro delineators. Whites couldn't compete with their authenticity and often their talent, so they turned their own minstrel shows into vaudeville, but blackface characterizations were still an essential part of the act. That's what the minstrels are here for, so At the same time, African Americans were being lynched by the hundreds and shunned by mainstream society. They were the subjects of the most popular music of the time, so-called coon songs, that like minstrel shows, depicted black life as free, careless, and non-threatening to anyone. Whites were led to believe that this young man's sole desire was to sing and dance for them. If I saw a black-faced performer at that time, uh, I guess I was in my early teens, on I didn't think anything of it because it was the time that I was living. It was the late 20s. I can look back now, I dislike having to say this, but I realize my mother and father were bigots. But I think everybody Everybody in Chicago were bigots. Sitting by the river on a summer evening, listening to the darkest hum. White vaudevillians maintained that white fantasy begun during minstrel times, that separate but equal was okay with Mammy, and that blacks were simple, happy creatures who loved to entertain and had lots of time to do it. 
with just a little cotton picking here and there between fish fries and steamboat arrivals. The myth lasted a very long time, as Topsy and Eva, Vaudeville's Duncan sisters, were still working it in 1960. The Duncans were the last minstrels. Real African Americans were forced to go along with the myth by wearing ridiculous or stereotyped clothing on stage, and only playing versions of Sambo or Zip Coon. Because Sambo was the willing retainer, he was that slave who, uh, who would sing songs like Carry Me Back to Old Virginia. Uh, on the other hand, Zip Coon then becomes an aggressive black man who's still ignorant, but uh, is pretentious. Black performers almost always had to be in a racial context. I don't know why feel this way. Eunice Wilson sings a fine number that has nothing to do with fruits and vegetables. So why does she have to do it in front of giant watermelons? I remember once I had added a wonderful song called Shoe Shine Boy to my repertoire. And it was a perfect song for a kid of 12, 13 to sing. And I sang this song. I had an arrangement of it with an orchestra and so forth. And uh, I was booked into the, the Oriental Theater in Chicago. And they had a, there was a wonderful theater with a wonderful line of chorus girls and a great choreographer and producer and so forth. And when she heard about the colored boy coming to work at the theater, her mind began to click, apparently, and when I got there, she had a whole big production number about Shoeshine Boy. And, of course, I was in it, and uh, I had to give up my nice arrangement and then perform in her production, which included running up and down uh, the chorus girls in front of them with a shoeshine cloth and shining their shoes. And my nice white tail suit had been tossed aside and I was wearing some kind of stylized version of tatters and rags. That was my final week in vaudeville. Now I remember as a kid, you know, you know, hold on there now. Now Sapphire done told me that you owes me a nickel. And I used to go like, why do you talk like you know? <laughs> to my mother? Why do you talk like that? The white performers who did minstrelsy um, did not really do black comedy at all. I mean, the jokes had nothing to do with blacks whatsoever. They were basically gags that were taken, and, and they, they were of um, show business origin. They were riddles and gags taken from uh, the northern stage. When blacks came in, you had the emergence of an authentic form of black entertainment, although they still veiled it with the stereotypes that had been set up by the white performers. The, the, the definition for acting is to do. All of this is an act. Leonard Reed is an African-American who played in both all-white and all-black vaudeville. I told you why they put on cork. Not to be black, but to get the expressions from the face. When you put on cork and white lips, you can move your lips around and everybody can see them moving around, and that's a laugh. And I think anything that you can do to get a laugh should be in show business. Show business is show business. And I think that burnt cork for a lot of those vaudevillians was a mask so that when they came off stage, they could disappear into the crowd and nobody would know who, who they were. Almost all the black comedians before 1950 wore blackface, even for black audiences. In the beginning, they had to. Yeah, let me tell you about that bull of my father's. You see, like but some wanted to, like the great comedian Dewey Pigmeat Markham. And that bull is so fast and so smart, every afternoon about 5 o'clock, he goes way up to the far end of that pasture and race that train five and a half miles. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Would you believe it? That bull beat that train by half a mile. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it's some bull. <laughs> and when Pigmeat took off his cork, he lost the edge that he had in laughter. I said, Pigmeat, what's happening? I said, the bit isn't going. He said, I don't know, I can't express myself anymore. 
He said, they made me take off the cork, and the cork was not to prove that I was black. They knew I was black. He said, but I, Negro, that's what he said, but I just lost the edge. I can't feel like I felt when I had the cork on. And he was broken hearted till the end. Pig Meat was broken hearted till the end that he had to take off cork. Pig Meat Markham was one of the last American performers to take off the mask. His fans were surprised to discover that his face was darker than his makeup. He had been lightening up, not blacking up, for 40 years. <laughs> In mainstream vaudeville, only one black act was allowed per show, if that. But black performers did have a place to work and learn their craft, the toba circuit. The uh, TOBA circuit consisted of a whole black theater circuit consisting, starting with Chicago Grand Theater to St. Louis to Kansas City to Tulsa to Oklahoma City. You know, I get excited just thinking about, you know, realize this has been 70 years ago since I did these dates. On the TOBA circuit, monologist Moms Mabley developed a routine that spanned six decades. They fired me. Of course, when they fired me, when I lose my job, I lose my man. That is since I got well. Kind of old, you know. Now, don't get me wrong. It ain't no disgrace to be old. But darn, if it ain't inconvenient, I can tell you that much about it. Knock me out, both of I love the dance. At least I used to love the dance. Am I blue? There was a lot for artists to be blue about working Toba, an acronym that stood for Theater Owners Booking Association. But for performers, it always meant tough on black asses. White owners, bad theaters, hardly any pay, and mostly in the South. Cause there was a time when I was his only one, but now I'm the sad and lonely one, Lordy. They call up and say, Bailey, we got a nigger here that says he's yours. His name is so-and-so, and, -so and, and Bailey would say, yeah, that's one of my niggers, he's at the theater, let him alone. And they would let him go. You could not walk the street after dark in the South? Uh, like pardon me. Easy. Ladies and gentlemen, I like it this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the phone just rang. This one here? Didn't you hear it? Oh, no, I didn't. Hello. What's with this guy? Yes, Mr. Reed's office. Must Mr. Reed? Yes, for you. Must be for me. Got to make him think you're big time. Yeah. Always have a secretary. He's big. Hello? Yes, this is Reed. Leonard Reed and Willie Bryant became stars at the Apollo in New York, like the Toba Theaters, a place where African-American performers could work before their peers to find their own voices in their own communities. But to become national stars, they had to deal with the white world, and that was really easy. As a young black performer, I was not allowed to stay in many of the hotels where I worked. I think that's, to people who are young today, unimaginable, but it's quite true. We never saw them at the same hotel we stayed at, and they tried to keep this from the kids. But I knew as a kid, that the, the black people and the ethnic people had to go miles out, away out of the way to, to get to a boarding house or get to a pl place that would serve them food. If it was a white, you know, uh, bill, and no white audiences, white people on the stage and everything, they would want us to stay in, in a black hotel, you know. But, uh, and that's another thing where my brother and I, we sort of tried to clip that down too, you know. And go stay in, in the hotels where the other people stayed. Heaven's peace. Hey, that's mommy. Yeah? Yeah, man. Well, open it. Put my trust in goo for dust. Cause you know someday it may bring you a seven. 
talent, courage, and a refusal to be stereotyped, some performers overcame, like the Nicholas Brothers. Yeah! Naturally, we're going to say no if they ask us to do blackface and put on tramp thing. And... No, they never did ask us that. I mean, in, in all the years that we've been in show business, I think they thought we'd be out of character to do that because they always see us in the tuxedos and the tails with class and grace and all that. Maybe that's why we never got too many uh, parts in movies, you know, because we wouldn't do, we wouldn't do the mammy scene, you know, and stuff like that. So. Yui Blake always wore a dinner jacket on stage. He was proud of his music and insisted on showing that pride. Of all the vaudeville performers who overcame huge obstacles to achieve success and dignity, the first, the greatest, was Burt Williams. He started out a minstrel in 1893, and by 1910 was the most respected comedian on the American stage. Burt Williams' Sambo character, although he himself said it was the same shuffling nigger that was being portrayed by other people, was done with such subtlety that he came across as a human being. Bert Williams mesmerized the audience. As a matter of fact, one of the bits that he did in the 1919 Follies was a shoe store, and he describes how the shoes are too tight. And uh, my dad, who was a straight man, he says, well, uh, uh, what size do you wear? He says, well, I wear 10s, but 11s feel so good, I wear 12s. He just seemed to relax and uh, Everyone knew there was going to be a punchline, but he waited and waited, and he milked it for all it was worth. And then he would say the punchline very calmly. And his sense of timing was uh, remarkable. Sat on his uh, knees, as a matter of fact, when I was about five years old. He was a very nice, kindly gentleman, and all business. In the 1916 film, The Natural Born Gambler, Burt Williams recreated one of his most famous sketches, a mime poker game performed alone. Williams was, as Robert Townsend says, the Jackie Robinson of show business. Not only the first black American to star with an otherwise white cast on Broadway, but the first black American in our history to be admired and respected by people of all races. He died in 1922, only 46 years old. He worked himself to death, trying to prove something he had already proved decades before many times over.
the most successful vaudevillians, no matter what their ethnicity, had one reoccurring problem. Weber and Fields had the problem for 60 years. You take the knife like this, you shove the knife down the oyster's throat. Their shapes, their costumes, and their act were instantly recognizable. Like this, you shove the knife down the oyster's throat. And cut his teeth out. Yeah, no, you don't cut his teeth out. You take the oyster out of the overcoat. He's got the overcoat. Shoot it, I wish I had mine, I got the ticket. You lay the oyster down and you get a can. And rush the duck. R no, you don't rush the duck. You get a can full of beer. Beer, there is no beer in this. And I can't do the trick. You get the Except this isn't Weber and Fields. It's two other guys. They call themselves impressionists or impersonators, but the impersonated call them thieves. Hey, what is that you got there? Why, that's a newspaper. I thought it was wrapping paper. That's the evening news. It feels like a post. You put Father accused, not only did he accuse people of imitating him, there were people's names we couldn't mention in the house. He'd get so angry. And uh, Danny Kay we couldn't talk about. Uh, and we couldn't talk about Burl. Take all of me. Composer Gerald Marx wrote the classic All of Me and sold it to singer Belle Baker. All of Me became associated exclusively with Belle Baker and Irving Berlin. I got used to reading in the paper every once in a while uh, that Irving Berlin wrote All of Me. Uh, the first time it makes you mad. But then you get used to it, and then when I'd occasionally run into Berlin on Broadway, uh, every single time he saw me, he said, Hey, how do you like the way my song is doing? By 1932, Henry Ford's Motor Company had turned out 186 million vehicles. I don't want to wake up. Shirley Temple, the greatest of all kid acts, made her first movie in 1932. Now was the time to fight, to fight for the best interest of our city. Fiorello LaGuardia tried to outlaw burlesque. And there was only one all vaudeville theater left in America, the Palace. The Palace was open in New York. We had a, a, a contract to go in there, and it, it's, it's supposed to be a high epitome of everything, to go work the, the palace. Not to us, to us, we were working in Harlem, I, anywhere. So we had the contract, the, the damn theater closed. <laughs> it, it finished. Sandy Lane, Sandy Lane, After more than a decade in bad health, Vaudeville was circling the drain. To too many people, it looked like this. Tired old routines performed in big empty theaters by tired old men. Times had changed, and Vaudeville hadn't. Change is the law of life, and you have to adapt to, to different circumstances. If you don't change, you die. We were cowards. Vaudevillians were a bunch of cowards. We were afraid to try some new material. I worked the million dollar circuit for a little while. I was at the close of it. I think I closed vaudeville. I was the end of it because it was just a, a dance act. And dance acts, that's what happened to vaudeville. You started losing the novelty acts and you started getting too many singers, too many dancers, just too many, it became boring. If you had a great act and you were booked across the circuit, they didn't want you to change your act. That's what they booked, that's what they wanted. It got so with many of the acts that the audience knew the act as well as the fella performing. That is what finally killed Vaudeville, because we would play the same theater year after year, year after year, with exactly the same act. And every Vaudevillian was the same way. Audiences found other places to go exciting new places that were still convenient and cheap. And they didn't have to give up vaudeville. They would buy an act and put them on a two-reel, and it was so sad because if it was a dumb act, you know, an act that didn't speak or sing, but it was an act that did novelty things, once they did that on film, there was no place to go anyway. The film went. You didn't. 
That was starvation. All right, everybody All right, quiet, please. After the bell. <laughs> A 1926 film demonstrating sound production techniques is also an opportunity to watch vaudevillians Witt and Berg give away their act. It was a good act and nice to have it saved forever on film. But nobody ever heard of Wittenberg again. Some vaudeville theaters became cinemas with live acts between features. Vaudeville drew the crowds originally, but eventually the vaudevillians were called coolers because their job was to fill the time it took the projectors to cool. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is only about like an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 25 minutes long. So every time the, show, the movie ended, we have to do a show. And that's where I, third day, I was exhausted. I collapsed and they carried me off to the hospital. But that is how I became a choreographer. I played eight shows a day when I played the Paramount in New York. We'd do a show, a movie, a show, a movie. And in those days, I can't understand some of these people who think that one show a night is too much work for them. Movies were bad for vaudeville, but in some ways, radio was worse. It came directly to people in their homes. You could attend in your underwear if you wanted to. And in 1932, when almost a quarter of the audience was unemployed, Radio was all free. People stayed home. And we wanted to hear it. We would cluster around a radio backstage. Bands had always been in vaudeville. But when radio made them famous, they took over the whole show with live acts thrown in between sets, but only a few. For the majority of vaudevillians, the handwriting was on the screen. First the big screen, and then the little one. I know when Milton Berle first started to do his Tuesday night show and say we were working one of the theaters in town, you could shoot a cannon up the aisle there, nobody'd get hurt. And acts on the bill saying, well, we bought a restaurant, are we going into the hotel business, or we're gonna open a saloon, <laughs> or something, or anything. And, and people scrambling to save their lives and save themselves with dignity. Artists looked everywhere for work, state fairs, nightclubs and resorts, like New York's Catskills, where pros like Leo Fuchs and Yetta Swirling could still do their stuff. Vaudeville had always been a major American export, and that increased. Australian headliners like the contortionist Napier and Yvonne found themselves sharing the bill with American performers who couldn't find work back home. But the majority of vaudevillians stayed where they were and tried to adapt. Some were fantastically successful, but for every artist who made it elsewhere, there were a thousand others who couldn't. Won't you come and let me rock you in my cradle of love? We'll cuddle all the time. Oh, I want a loving baby, and it might as well be you. Pretty baby of mine. 
headliner Ruth Edding retired voluntarily, saying there wasn't much satisfaction singing into a microphone. She was the exception. Most were like Chanteuse Raquel Miller. She was very famous once, a genius, according to Sarah Bernhardt. But she just disappeared. I think that uh, most of the vaudevillians didn't make it. They didn't know what was required. And uh, I think that most of them got lost. I never could make it in television because I could not remember. Vaudevillians were so used to what they were doing that if you threw something new at them, they'd get lost. Only a few from vaudeville actually ever made it in television and movies. A handful, that's about it. And finally, I got in the interview a 20th Century Fox for a movie. And I talked to the casting guy. Not long, because he said, Hey, I saw you at the palace last week. If we ever get a part in the picture where a guy throws stuff around the stage, we're going to call you. Now, it took me 20 years to get over that. I figured, ah, these guys can't be that dumb. <laughs> they are. Artists of color discovered that the new media were less welcoming than vaudeville. For the dance team Toy and Wing, there was no place to go. Not many films, not much television. I've had white people say that to me. Like, if you were white, Fayard, think of the things that, that, that could have happened to you doing the things that you do and being white. 20th Century Fox should have starred us in movies. But because of the color of my skin, they didn't do it. And they knew how great we were. If it had been a, two white dancers, Bam, right away. Mother didn't think vaudeville was over. Mother thought vaudeville would come back. She always thought that. Wherever she is, she probably still does. <laughs> vaudeville died, but it's always had a lively corpse. During World War II, both headliners and acts that hadn't worked in decades went out again to entertain the troops. <laughs> Vaudevillians knew how to satisfy people who desperately needed an escape because they had spent their lives learning how. Vaudeville was the great teacher. What do you want to hear? Huh? What is that, the bumblebee? You couldn't have stayed home today. I mean, you had to be in there. still living off the energy of vaudeville. If you like Bob Hope, if you like Burt Lahr, if you like the Marx Brothers, if you like W.C. Fields, you know, if you like Buster Keaton, if you like Charlie Chaplin, well, where they went to school in vaudeville. All the black vaudevillians, you know, made it easier because they broke ground. You know, like when we, you know, talk about Burt Williams because he was the first African American to perform he made it acceptable. I mean, I think without all of these different performers, no, I wouldn't be here. And what I learned in Fortable was hit him fast, get the laughs, <laughs> which later on paid off because I did the Ed Sullivan show, and, and Sullivan says, can you do a minute and a half? And I said, beautiful, right up my alley. It's called The Rabbit from the Chapeau. Always something new, huh? 
Q passes over the hat with the old duster room. Passes over the hat. Inside. What happened to the duster? <laughs> aren't you pretty close, aren't you? <laughs> A sneaky audience. That's the worst part. <laughs> Come in, I better hang this back up. Inside! <laughs> Inside the hat, Peter, the little tiny bunny. Get ready, Pete. I'm coming down to get you. Here we go. This may come as news, but I doubt it. No rabbit. <laughs> we were taught our business. There's, there's the best thing I've said. We were taught our business. It wasn't just the big stars who carried on vaudeville's skills and traditions. I must have a lover who was free for me. Then I'd be more than satisfied. But people like Virginia McMath, too. Just another girl singer from Independence, Missouri, who learned her craft in vaudeville and picked up a new name along the way, Ginger Rogers. Thelma White kept her name, but like Ginger Rogers, went on to film, musical comedy, and her own all-girl orchestra. She played one of the pushers in a cult classic, Reefer Madness. Mate! What do you want? Bring me some reefers. Before retiring with her husband, female impersonator, Maurice Tony Millard to Van Nuys, California. I wish I knew just where to go. Can't go on this way, I know. Leonard Reed became a choreographer, teacher, and the comic sidekick of heavyweight champion Joe Lewis. June Havoc applied her vaudeville experience to a distinguished career on stage and screen. Television benefited from many vaudevillians like Rose Marie, Maury Amsterdam, and Carl Ballantyne, the original crazy sitcom character man. I could tell you of dozens of guys that are making big bucks today that I inspired. When CBS canceled his show in 1972, Ed Sullivan said, vaudeville has died its second death. He was talking about format, the every few minutes something different rule of vaudeville that television still follows especially in this multi-channel world that turns every viewer with a remote control into a vaudeville producer. When you speak of channel surfing, that's interesting. A man, woman at home creates his, her own vaudeville bill. I say switching from sports, it suddenly it's dull. The guy hit a home run with the bases full and the scores one, so you switch to a comedy act, or for that matter, to a documentary. And so that's the vaudeville act, isn't it? There's the comic, there's the serious, there's the acrobatic. It's all there. That's a new form. Still, still doing that, isn't there a kind of onanistic quality here? Isn't that kind of a doing it by yourself to yourself? Five, six, seven, and hop. Two, three. Up you go. One, two. And around. And one, two, three. Up with the arms. Channel surfers aren't the only modern do-it-yourself vaudevillians. The medium continues, not quite dead, because we still want to sing and dance, laugh and wonder. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Many of the dances are still being done today. The soft shoe, for instance, even the, the buck and wing, still become an essential part of choreography in Broadway, on the Broadway stage. And they were certainly a part of choreography on the uh, vaudeville stage. Every entertainment form has borrowed from vaudeville. Professional sports has giveaways, ladies' night. And Take Me Out to the Ball Game, written by vaudevillian Jack Norworth, even politics has vaudevillian connections. Now, my wife, as I said, knows I won't write for people unless I know what they, what they do. 
I said, honey, how do you like that? This afternoon, President Johnson called me, wants me to write some jokes for him. She says, tell him you don't write for him till you see him work. <laughs> Animated cartoons may be the most vaudeville-esque entertainments we have today. So it's not surprising that Gertie the Dinosaur, in 1904, one of the first animated cartoons was created by Winsor McKay to use in his vaudeville act. This is a little thing that came to me in the middle of the night. The stand-up comedians of vaudeville, Fred Allen, Doc Rockwell, Frank Fay, developed many of the techniques and the jokes still in constant use. The title of this poem is A Jockey's Lament. Hmm? It has something to do with a jockey. It's a shame she'll never be fancied again. She's putting on weight and she's gone on the feet. When she jumped, you could see it was a terrible strain. She's old and she's fat and she does nothing but eat. Hey, hey. Frank Fay, the vaudeville, had an easy way, a sort of weltschmerzy, world-weary way, Fay swooning, Fay going away. So I always thought of whenever I see William Buckley on TV, I think Frank Fay, because they both have that same fade-away quality. Okay, now for your amazement and Some vaudeville connections to contemporary entertainment are obvious. Gonzo the Great will grow a tomato plant whilst playing the 1812 overture on the violin. <laughs> the international super hit Muppet Show took place in a vaudeville theater. <laughs> this act may not last long. In fact, it's over. <laughs> One legacy of live variety entertainment has been directly represented by a group of performers sometimes called New Vaudevillians. In our cultural memory, there is, even those of us who are too young to have really seen vaudeville, there is a cultural almost dreamlike memory of something that occupied this place in people's lives and this force of theatrical energy. And it often has to do with a certain look and a certain feel, a certain historical style and a certain kind of physical action. And if you could touch on that, then an audience will be very moved by it. And what all these people have learned, I can't say it too often, is they learned how to corrupt an audience with pleasure. And there is no harder or more noble thing in a the theatrical profession than to do that. You love a business, you do it, and you get paid for it. How can you beat a combination like that? It's just magnificent. We loved it. What I've given up? I don't think I've given up anything because I enjoyed what I was doing. I loved it. And so did my brother. We had a ball. What am I proudest of? I'm proudest of that the brother and I, or me, get the opportunity to, to do what we wanted to do on stage. And nothing, nothing took that away from us. You know. We did it all.
Major funding for American Masters is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support of viewers like you. Additional funding was provided by Rosalind P. Walter, Jack Rudin, and the Andre and Elizabeth Cortez Foundation.